Good morning, good afternoon, dear participants. A very warm welcome to all of you to the IHE Delft Alumni and Partners online seminar, a collaboration between IHE Delft and the Water Channel. My name is Long Huang and I am program manager from the Water Channel. It is my great pleasure to facilitate today's seminar on the topic of sanitation and groundwater, revealing the hidden links and risk management. This seminar is part of our online seminar series under the Alumni and Partners Program at IHE Delft. And of course, as 2022 is closing, we are very pleased to join you all here when the festive season is about to start. This year in 2022, we celebrated the World Toilet Day. And this year, we also dedicated the World Water Day to groundwater with the theme, making invis the invisible visible. Both events underline the impact of sanitation on groundwater. And we feel the importance of insights and perspectives about the highly relevant, yet often invisible linkages between sanitation and groundwater quality. In this context, we dedicate this seminar to discuss mechanisms of groundwater contamination from sanitation sources and the associated risks on water supply and public health. Furthermore, we will hear about two case studies on urban aquifers affected by wastewater infiltration. In this panel discussion, follow-up and the Q&A session, we will invite all of you to share questions and remarks and thoughts on the topic, and we will also explore management strategies and solutions. And we will do all of this with our two special speakers of today. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Konstantina Velkushanova. Dr. Velkushanova is senior lecturer in non sewage sanitation at IHE Delft. She has a vast experience of 20 years working in wash and sanitary engineering. She spent nearly a decade in University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, where she has been working on different research projects and activities on non suit sanitation, fecal sludge management, development and evaluation of innovative sanitation technologies and capacity building. She is actively involved in different programs and initiatives supporting the global sanitation agenda. And very recently, she also the lead editor of the recently published book, Methods for Fecal Sludge Analysis, aiming at a standardized approach for fecal sludge analysis worldwide. She's also a coordinator and lecturer of the educational programs under the largest capacity building network in series, the Global Sanitation Graduate School. Thank you very much, uh, Constantina, for joining us today. Our second speaker of today is uh, Dr. Jan Willem Foppen. Dr. Foppen is an Associate Professor of Hydrology at IHE Delft. He has a Master's Degree in Hydrogeology and a PhD from the Free University VU Amsterdam. In 1995 and 1996, he was stationed in Sana, Yemen, where he was part of a project team aimed to identify sources for drinking water supply of Sana. Intrigued by poor groundwater health conditions in Sana, he focused on transportation of the fecal indicator organism, organism and Escherichia coli. I'm sorry if I make it wrong with the pronunciation. Maybe Jan Willem can help me later on. Um, in saturated progress media, whereby the aim was to extend the colloid filtration theory. This work has re resulted in about 10 publications in peer-reviewed journal. Dr. Foppen works intensively on groundwater management and modeling across different contexts. Thank you very much, Jan Willem, for taking time for joining us today. Um, before we begin with the presentation, I would like to take a brief moment to mention some of the logistic points. We welcome you all to have an interaction with our speakers by posting questions in the chat box. Um, and please feel free to introduce yourself. I've seen that a lot of uh, our participants are already doing so, so great. Thank you very much. We will collect all these and address them in the Q&A session. All information and recording of our webinars uh, will be available at the Water Channel website as well as the IHE dedicated website. We will share all follow-up information with you after the event. And lastly, we'd like to thank Ms. Maria Laura Sorrentino, the Alumni Relations Advisor from IHE to be with us today. Thank you for mobilizing IHE uh, faculties, students, and its very active alumni network in organizing this seminar series. 
And without any further ado, I would like to invite our first guest, Dr. Velkusanova, for her presentation. And over to you, uh, dear Constantina. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted to mention this in the beginning. Um, so my focus is mainly on sanitation and I'm not a groundwater expert, but my um, dear colleague, Young Willem, is the, the expert on the groundwater. So I think um, for um, just a, a disclaimer <laughs> that we have this uh, distribution between us. But I think it's a wonderful uh, combination uh, to share some of the aspects on why sanitation is so important to pay attention to and uh, the groundwater contamination um, pathways are one of the important aspects that we often cannot see. Um, that's why we had this uh, theme of the world water toilet day. Um, it's invisible problem, but it's quite a serious problem. So um, where are we today? Um, well, if we have a look, uh, we see that um, we have quite a significant um, <laughs> progress maybe achieved um, towards the SDGs. But at the same time, we see that we have um, quite a few more um, aspects to consider and we need to do quite a lot more work. Um, so if we want to uh, get where we want to get, especially for achieving SDG 6, we need to go four times, five times, nine or even 15 times faster um, in some of the uh, low and middle income countries where uh, the, uh, some of the development is not so progress. So what, what is the current situation in the world in terms of distribution of sanitation facilities? Well, th this is a very beautiful data uh, from the joint monitoring program. And we can see that um, uh, usually in the world, we have quite a significant disparity in the distribution of sanitation services. So, for example, we can see is um, that in high income countries, the most of the sanitation is um, safely managed and then uh, we have some form of a basic sanitation. But if we have a look at countries in Central or Southern Asia, uh, the safely managed sanitation ratio reduces quite significantly. But if we see even in sub-Saharan Africa, this uh, number is reducing more and more. And what is important to see is that in some of these regions, we have quite a lot of uh, distribution of unimproved sanitation or open defecation, which is one of the direct impacts also on um, uh, the groundwater services. So here we can see um, what is um, safely managed sanitation. Uh, this is improved facilities which are not shared with other households and where excreta are safely disposed in situ or transported in treated offsite. So we can see that quite a lot of the safely managed um, sanitation facilities are mostly focused in the north. And in the, contra uh, in the contrary, if we want to see the share of the population without access to improved sanitation, uh, we can see that the most significant impact is lying in Africa and then in some parts of Asia. Improved sanitation facilities are designed to hygienically separate excreta from human uh, contact. Uh, they could be flush um, in pipe water, uh, sewer systems, septic tanks, pit latrines, um, improved pit latrines, composting toilets, etc. So what we see here in the red is that actually in these parts we have oh, in some places, over 60% of the population don't have access to safely managed sanitation. So how do we make the link with the drinking water facilities? Well, let's have a look at the distribution again in um, safely managed um, drinking water supply, basic, limited or unimproved. 
we can see again that in some parts, and once again in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, we have only 30% of the uh, water um, a provision is um, safely managed. We have basic about 35% and we have quite a large number yet uh, of access which is limited or unimproved with um, nearly 7% not having access um, or having access only to surface water in the sub-Saharan region. And once again, if we try to translate this, we see that again in very in almost the same regions where we have unimproved sanitation we have um, problems related to um, water management so in this figure we see what is the share of debts um, attributed to unsafe water resources and in africa and sub-saharan africa this could be um, up to um, eight or 10% of the overall uh, debt ratio, which is also quite prominent in India. So what does it mean? Um, well, there is a significant global health impact due to the inadequate sanitation. Um, there's some stats from the World Health Organization, how many people die due to diarrhea diseases, um, also, unsafe sanitation is the major factor um, contributing to the transmissions and outbreaks of um, some diseases like cholera or typhoid or hepatitis. Um, there is also a significant problem with uh, the, in some places with the um, distribution of helmets, which are causing pars parasitic infections. Um, and we don't only speak about health issues, but we speak about societal issues. Um, so when we speak about basic form of sanitation, it's usually stigmatized and associated with poverty, which also causes social inequalities. And because of the poor sanitation and the water supply, um, Currently, the world pays about 260 billion US dollars per year, um, which is going towards um, healthcare, loss of opportunities, and many, many, many other things. So we have, what I've tried to do is try to create <laughs> the link between sanitation and uh, safe water provision globally. So we saw that there is a disparity in the sanitation provision. We currently have about 40% of the world population lacking access to adequate sanitation, about 3.6 billion. And then they use um, existing on-site sanitation systems that are often not so safe to use. They don't have uh, safe treatment or they go discharged directly into the water bodies. At the same time, we have um, some systems in, in between, which are septic tanks or uh, improved pit latrines that provide some form of a safe capture, but they are related to a lot of challenges in maintenance. And once they are not maintained properly, they also pose risk to the environment. And we have, of course, the traditional waterborne sanitation systems, which are the sewer with wastewater treatment plant. But unfortunately, this is not possible in many of the countries that we saw some examples. I would mention why, uh, but one of the reasons is that they could be uh, very costly. So these are some examples to see how is sanitation managed in some parts of the world. So this picture, for example, is from Durban in South Africa, where I used to work. This is um, a ventilated improved pit latrine that has been soaked with um, a lot of liquid, which clearly uh, had been infiltrating during the rainy season through the groundwater. Um, and of course, there is a lot of trash uh, inside, which makes it very difficult to manage.
These are some other examples uh, from other parts. On the left um, bottom is from Cape Town. Um, we have some of them are from um, Kenya and this picture as well. So this is just to, to give the contrast in some regions how we are dealing with sanitation. In other parts of the world, we have really greatly managed wastewater treatment uh, plants. But um, what happens is that, unfortunately, this cannot be achieved as a safely managed option through the entire world. Why? Well, firstly, I mentioned that it's, it could be quite costly, it requires huge investments, and also um, it requires um, huge investments for operation and maintenance. Another factor is the water scarcity. So we have um, in this map is showing a prediction on the water st stress by, um, by countries. Um, and what we see is that um, quite a lot of the countries worldwide would be at a high or extremely high uh, pressure. Um, which shows the ratio of withdrawals to, to available water for supply. So clearly, this is not an uh, option for, um, for trying to, to sewer every part of the world. On the top of this, we have a significantly increase in the world population and uh, the urbanization, which contributes to a lot of uh, other challenges. So what we saw um, in the World um, Toilet Day this year, we celebrated the connection between, um, well, we celebrated the World Toilet Day and we wanted to raise awareness about the problems that could be caused by um, on-site sanitation um, that could not be safely managed and uh, the access to uh, groundwater uh, supply, which contradictory in many places, they could be very, very close. And we can see some examples. Okay, so this is a summary. This comes from the Compendium of Sanitation Systems and Technologies by EVAC, which is based in the Switzerland. So we see here a distribution uh, between um, different options for on-site sanitation systems. So th the purpose of all of them is of course to, to provide safe containment where um, the excreta or the ge generated uh, black water, wastewater is contained safely, so then it doesn't pose um, health um, or, or, or any environmental pollution um, risks before it's been emptied and transported and treated safely. So we have single pit latrines, we have double uh, pit latrines, we have different options, septic tanks. It depends what kind of toilets, whether it's a flush system, whether it's a dry system. So there is a variety of options. But what we see in reality is once we have um, these installations, in many parts, they may not work properly or they may pose partially partially a risk to the environment and pollution of the surrounding soil and surrounding um, groundwater. So this example is showing how uh, the bottom of the pit latrines could be open. So if it's not lined properly, then we can have um, uh, we can have um, leaking into infiltration through the soil. In rainy seasons, uh, pit latrines could be also flooded uh, from, the, yeah, from the rainflow. And this again ends into the um, groundwater. This example is showing us um, a, 
septic tanks, which could also pose a risk to the environment if it's not maintained and managed safely. Uh, for example, if we have different cracks in the piping, if we have um, not regular emptying, so the effluent is overflowing to the environment um, and in the local area, um, we can also have cracks or something not functioning properly in the outlet uh, drain into the surrounding water bodies. There are, of course, design considerations of minimum distances between the um, sanitation systems, um, minimum depth, uh, depending again the, uh, on the availability of um, how shallow is the groundwater? Um, so, so there are quite a few um, regulations. But in reality, in many places, not all the regulations for building these systems are strictly followed yet. And many households build digging their, their pit latrines without any lining, uh, just because this is the only option they can afford. And what are the dangers? Well, we speak about um, pollution, but um, the main aspect is related to public health. So um, fecal sludge or um, feces contain a lot of different uh, pathogens. And once uh, they end up in the, into the environment and into the uh, water bodies, this is becoming a problem because this causes the sp spread of um, waterborne diseases. And we can see how this, zooming a little bit more, how this can affect the um, situation uh, in the general water services, the water supply and the quality of the water that we are going to use for water supply. In many locations um, in the world, um, the piped water supply may not be possible. For example, in rural settings where the most of the households would use um, wells or boreholes. And if we have the pit latrines that are deep or for some reason the, the leachate is part partially ending into the ground uh, water table, then this results into um, the users taking contaminated um, groundwater. Not only this, but um, the groundwater eventually joins uh, with the surface water um, sources, which also <laughs> just distributes the contamination. So this is a very brief uh, case study from Uganda by one of my students, uh, Julius, um, who graduated this year. So he was looking at linkages between sanitation and groundwater. He had a very short time and um, young Willem has a much more extensive um, knowledge to share also from Uganda and linkages. But what I wanted to show you here is um, he was looking at different aspects related to distance uh, of um, uh, the, the, what, the um, uh, water supply um, um, resources to the on-site sanitation. Um, so the um, one of the background that he has been dealing with is that um, the low uh, piped water service coverage in the urban areas has led to reliance on groundwater sources uh, and alternative, as an alternative. Um, there is a major reliance uh, on on-site sanitation, um, but at the same time, because of the faster um, population growth, this uh, poses additional risks because the on-site sanitation systems are becoming closer and closer to the um, uh, different uh, groundwater uh, sources like boreholes or wells. So these are some pictures. You would see a few more from uh, young Willem. And um, 
um, Julius did some studies uh, with questionnaires from the um, from the households. So he was just um, interested to see what uh, type of sources the most of them use. And it turns out that 20% um, of them rely on borehole. Um, only 2% um, rely on uh, tap water and 70% take water from uh, two sources, two or more sources. There are shallow wells um, and protected springs. Um, he has been looking at some potential um, outbreaks or common illnesses between um, the same um, interviewees and about 25% reported that um, they commonly have diarrhea, 9% um, reported typhoid um, and uh, yeah, some other diseases. And of course, malaria is not related to this part. Um, and quite a lot of them are aware of the problem. And somehow um, the answers here show that there is an awareness that the water is not very clean because 96% reported that they use boiling of the water be before consumption. So what Julius uh, found out here is that there is a link between the distance of the on-site sanitation systems to uh, the concentration of E. coli um, and total coliform respectively. So I'm not going to go any more into this study and I wanted to end uh, with a few slides on how do we bridge the gap? So I gave you an overview of what are the impacts, what is the sanitation challenge, and how it's virtually impossible in some places to install sewer uh, type of systems. But we also cannot accept to have unsafe sanitation. And um, SDG.62 is looking at the provision of safe san sanitation for all. So, um, one of the aspects is that there are um, a lot more and more innovations in the space of sanitation that are looking at protecting public health and the environment and um, obviously uh, preventing fecal sludge um, contamination to end into the groundwater. So this system has been developed by University of South Florida. They have been doing different stages of testing, but it shows you that their options of treatment on site instead of uh, collecting it and then having to be empty and treated and also uh, producing uh, clean water for reflushing and some um, potentials for hydroponics for um, plant growth um, within the system. This is another type of system that is looking at more of a community-based uh, type of uh, treatment where there are um, treatment tanks underground, looking at some biological form of treatment ending with um, um, <clears throat> electrochemical uh, um, treatment that is um, um, purifying the water and then it kills off the pathogens and the water could be reused for flushing. And of course, this is running uh, off the grid. So all of um, what you see on the top is solar panels. This is another example. Um, it's the ESOS Smart Toilet Sanitation, which has been developed by the um, um, by one of our professors here, Professor Bajanovic uh, at IHG and his team. And this system is um, actually um, designed for uh, sanitation in emergencies. Um, we know that this also is quite vital uh, for provision when we have uh, natural um, causes like earthquakes or tsunamis. Um, the provision of safe, suitable sanitation solutions is quite important to prevent groundwater and environmental contamination and, of course, uh, protecting the public health. Um, another option could be uh, container-based sanitation, which is looking at the uh, treatment of uh, all the excreta that has been safely um, collected, tr emptied, transported and treated and potentially looked at uh, safe disposal um, um, options. So for all these innovations, 
there are also different types of ISO standards or different types of other standards that are looking at different parts of the sanitation service chain to be able to treat, uh, treat um, to, to be able to ensure that all the management and the technological solutions that are implemented are looking at um, the safety, um, the public health aspects and the environmental uh, um, protection. So then we don't have uh, these kind of situations that we discussed earlier. And of course, the one important aspect uh, that we could do is um, looking at the um, the provision of more sanitation experts uh, because this is really needed in order to achieve what we want for SDG 6.2. Thank you. Thank you very much, Constantina, for your very informative uh, presentation. I personally like the technologies that were presented. I hope we will have some time to discuss later. Um, and without any further ado, I would like to invite our second speaker, Dr. Jan Willem Foppen, to have his uh, talk, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me try to share my screen. And then open my presentation, which I'll put on presentation mode. Um, so I think everything is clear now. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so um, groundwater pollution from wastewater infiltration. Uh, I will be talking about that. And then let me just try to get rid of one bar here. Uh, no, I cannot really get rid of the bar. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, then one particular example, which is the Boise Tree area in Kampala. Uh, Kampala is the capital of Uganda in Eastern Africa. And there, I will just have a look at what we have done in the last, roughly in the last 10 years, uh, not continuously, but we have done some studies there. And first of all, I will just look at the area, then at the situation uh, concerning the infiltration of uh, wastewater uh, surrounding two pit latrines, just two pit latrines. Then I will try to scale up a bit and look at the uh, shallow aquifer and try to give you some of the, the complexities when we when we want to scale up. Um, and then the situation becomes even more complex uh, the moment you look at the entire system, which is composed of a shallow and a deeper aquifer. Um, that is with respect to chemistry. And then I will just briefly also look at the microbiology of things. And then finally, um, we are going to look at groundwater management in this particular case, which is not an easy thing uh, to do. Let me see whether this works. No, not yet. Yeah, now it works. Okay, so the study area is here. Uh, in fact, we are uh, here, a piece of Kampala. Let me see whether I can do something about the pointer options so here you can see this uh, laser pointer is that clear yeah okay good so uh, this is a, a hill uh, this is a hill and this is another hill and here we have a valley and uh, in that valley which used to be a former swamp uh, we have a couple of slums located and uh, we have here we see here boys at three so we have Boise 2, we have Boise 1, we have Boise 3. And uh, the case study concerning the two pit latrines is focused here in this part of Boise. Um, so I will first focus on that part. And then later on, I will try to look at uh, a bit of a larger picture and mainly focus on this cross section. So that little square that you just saw uh, is uh, a few uh, one to two square kilometers. And here you have an overview of um, point source pollutions. Um, 
which are pit latrines, solid waste, open dumps, and animal feedlots. Beware, this is already quite some time ago, so this is you know fairly old information. The solid waste dumps are uh, nowadays they are sort of gone. The animal feedlots they are there, but not that much. But the pit latrines are still there. So this here, this square is 250 by 250 meters. So you can see that in this slum area, uh, the valley between the hill here and the hill there, there are many pit latrines in this slum area. And they are usually in open connection with groundwater. So how does it look? It looks like this. So here you have a, a, a toilet and uh, below that you have a pit latrine. And the pit latrine is actually raised because there is hardly any space for uh, the, the pit to, uh, to, to be there because groundwater levels are quite shallow. So therefore, population raises the pit uh, in order to, you know, to be a little bit above the groundwater table. Here you have another example of a toilet and uh, below the toilet you have a raised pit latrine. This structure looks a little bit better. It even has a door and this structure uh, doesn't really look very well maintained. So uh, if we just look at uh, all these pit latrines, then most of them are like this. So here we have uh, an overview of what do we see in terms of uh, sanitation facilities, we have usually the traditional pit latrine, predominantly more than 80% of the facilities are the traditional pit latrines, like in the example that I just showed. Most of them are also raised. So uh, here is an, uh, a little cross section. So this is just a few meters, like 10 to 15 meters. Uh, and here we have also a few meters of elevation. And here we have these two unlined pit latrines that I just talked about. And they're not to scale, so they're just put in there, uh, just, you know, for your reference. Uh, we have here uh, a water table that is in blue, and this here is the shallow aquifer, which is composed of loam and clay sand. And then below that shallow aquifer, we have a layer, which is a few meters of stiff clays. We installed uh, a number of piezometers there, upstream of the facilities and also downstream of the facilities. And we monitored groundwater quality. And what we saw was um, an overview like this. So here you have the pit latrines. This is the cross section. And you have here the results of the piezometers in terms of stiff diagrams that we use hydrogeologists as a way to represent groundwater quality. And what you can see is that upstream, uh, the stiff diagrams are fairly small. Also, this one here is fairly small, which tells us that the uh, amount of ions, uh, cations and anions, are not that huge. When we look immediately downstream of the pit latrine, we see that concentrations of uh, most major cations and anions really increases a lot. And this little peak here tells us that there is also a lot of nitrate in there. When we look further downstream, we see that some of these ions are still in there, but the nitrate is already gone. Uh, and we were wondering what is going on here. Well, now we have to uh, look at it uh, from a little bit of another perspective, and we just have to realize that this uh, 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 slum area used to be a marsh uh, composed of papyrus. And, and that papyrus is still there. And it's still there and oxidizes. And when it does that, it produces anaerobic groundwater. And when you have anaerobic groundwater, one of the first things that uh, happened there is that nitrate is reduced. It, is, uh, it leaves the aquifer as nitrogen gas. And that's exactly what we see. So here we have our uh, uh, study area where we have these two pit latrines. Here you have some nitrate, but uh, immediately a few meters, a few meters below or downstream of the pit of tea, we, we see that the nitrate is already gone. And there we have manganese entering the scene. Nitrate is gone. And then here we get even uh, very strongly reducing conditions whereby we also have the production of iron 2 plus. Still, phosphorus is, is there as a result of uh, the infiltration of wastewater. 
um, but the, the, the nitrogen is already gone. Uh, mind you, this here is a bit of an exaggeration. This is only a few meters in terms of vertical extent. So here you have the aquifer, and there below it, you have that little stiff clay confining uh, layer. So this is the situation with respect to the shallow aquifer. It's the, 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 the pattern that we get here is it's complex. Um, you cannot just say that when, when wastewater infiltrates, uh, nitrate is produced and that's it. No, depending on local conditions, that nitrate can be reduced. You don't see nitrate anymore and uh, the effect uh, is a little bit, uh, uh, what is it, uh, gone. It doesn't mean that all the ions from wastewater are just gone. No, we're just talking about nitrate pollution in this particular case. Um, the previous picture was here, and uh, this gray thing is our stiff confining layer. This is the alluvial sands that we talked about. And now we look at the bigger picture. We have also springs here, and these springs, they are uh, not unimportant because they receive uh, uh, groundwater, uh, which is uh, aerobic. It has a moderate uh, specific electrical conductivity. It has very high nitrate concentrations. The pH is nice. It's fairly acidic and the residence times are quite limited. Um, when we go even further up here, so there's also some uh, what is it? Uh, people are living there, not that many, but there are definitely people living there. But what we see here is that we have, uh, again, uh, um, anaerobic water, sorry, we have aerobic water with a low uh, uh, electric conductivity, and their nitrate concentrations are, again, relatively low. We have here low nitrate concentrations. Here we have uh, a situation whereby we have very high nitrate concentrations. Here, the situation is a little bit mixed, uh, whereby we have high nitrate there and low nitrates uh, there as a result of anaerobic groundwater. So the take home message here is that it's complicated and uh, you really have to know your groundwater flow situation in order to be able to understand what the effect is of wastewater infiltration on your groundwater uh, quality. Um, so, focusing on these springs, where a lot of nitrates are there, um, here we have such a spring, and you can see that these springs, they are used for drinking water. So, the people living there, uh, they use this water because it is for free, it is, uh, so they don't have to pay a lot, and they really use this water massively. So this is just one spring. You see uh, 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 people, uh, mainly kids and uh, women, they are queuing up to get some water from that spring. Here we have another spring, same situation. Uh, people are queuing up to, uh, yeah, to get that water. That water, which is contaminated. Now we have just seen that it is contaminated with uh, chemicals, but when we just uh, look uh, to the microbiology of things, we see that E. coli as an indicator uh, uh, of uh, fecal contamination in groundwater is widespread. In addition to that, we did some uh, sequencing of DNA, uh, of viral DNA, and we saw that in that groundwater, there are a number of virus families uh, uh, that come, that must come from above ground hosts, like frogs and mice and rats and cows and horses, monkeys and humans, so they all live above ground, and we see that those virus concentrations are also found in groundwater. Uh, so there is, a, there is a direct link, not only from sanitation, but from land use as such, uh, and from the creatures living on, uh, on that land surface uh, to uh, groundwater. Um, in addition, we also uh, noticed a couple of pathogens uh, that we have not seen before in groundwater, so the pathogens as such are not new, but the fact that they were detected in groundwater was fairly new. Uh, herpes is there. Uh, we also saw papilloma and uh, we saw pox virus. All of that you can find in a publication by uh, Van der Vossenberg et al. Uh, in um, uh, ESMT Water last year. So, hmm, okay, ha uh, having seen this, uh, this sort of on-site sanitation, 
uh, and using an aquifer to get rid of your wastewater is maybe okay, but if downstream users use this groundwater for drinking water, then, then there is a problem. And that problem cannot be easily fixed. Um, it's very complex and there's no single solution to that problem. And I think this is the definition of a wicked problem, uh, which is known in literature. Uh, and then here, wicked denotes the resistance to solution rather than evil. I just got this from Wikipedia. So we, we looked at this wicked problem in the last couple of years in the project, focusing on transition management, which is especially meant to look at wicked problems. And the ultimate proposition in transition management is that front runners, they can influence a transition when they are given space to do some thinking and to uh, undertake some action. The definition of TM, transition management, is a stepwise participatory process, bringing together front runners and change agents to create a vision, uh, strategic transition pathways, and rooms for action to ignite and influence transitions. So we experimented with that transition management in a number of areas in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the last uh, years. And um, more, so I will not go into details of that, but more on this is on this website, tgroup.science. And uh, there is a video there. There are more videos. So one of them I just want to uh, highlight here. Uh, you can find it on the website, but um, it's also in here. So let me try to... Uh, can I now run this video? Let me just have a look at that. Uh, do something about my... Ah, yeah. So I just have a 60-second footage of that video that I, I would like to uh, share with you. In Voise, groundwater pollution mainly originates from the surrounding hills, like uphill Makarere, where wastewater pollutes groundwater, which slowly flows over a long period of time into Boise. All findings show that groundwater is contaminated. As you go from the hills down to the valleys, it becomes more contaminated. The teams organized dissemination meetings to inform the communities about the results of research and started to select actors for the organization of transition arenas. Actor selection is a key part of the transition management. And we were looking at those who are natural leaders, those who are active in doing something for the community. The transition arenas focused on the structuring of local problems, self and collective responsibility, envisioning and developing short, medium and long term actions to solve the problems. Invoicing groundwater pollution. My pointer options, let me go back. So more of this is this website, if you want to uh, have a look at that. Um, so yeah, now I come to my uh, conclusions. So wastewater pollutes groundwater, and we all know that chemically and biologically. Uh, and the fate of the pollution depends on aquifer characteristics and the flow system. So you cannot just separate those two. You have to take into consideration the aquifer characteristics and the flow system. Uh, if it is then the nexus between on-site sanitation and drinking water, uh, that is a problem which uh, I think we should consider to be a wicked problem. There are many ways to treat wicked problems, and one of these ways is transition management. Uh, and that may be used as a vehicle to sort of together to unravel that wicked problem. Having said that, I thank you very much. And uh, I think, uh, Long, the floor is open to questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem, for your uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I am sure that um, a lot of our audience will find um, the presented content from both speakers very, very interesting. So, so far we have heard about the mechanism of um, pollution from sanitation, we have heard also about the wicked problem and the links between drinking water and sanitation and how difficult it is. We think about uh, also very concrete technologies for um, improving the problem. So um, I'm very much looking forward to the, to the discussion and the Q&A.
In the meantime, I have collected quite a few of the questions from our audience, and I will share those questions and I will post that to both speakers and we will address them one by one. Just a moment, I will put them up. Yeah. The first question is from Wam Bui. Um, the question is uh, interesting to see the on site sanitation very applicable for a country like Kenya, where 60% of universal coverage is supposed to be on site. The only challenge is affordability. I would love to have one of our speakers to comment on this, uh, on affordability of these uh, services. I can step in. <laughs> yes, please. Maybe Young William can add. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Wambui, uh, for um, your comment and question. Yes, um, this is one of the aspects that um, often we look at the basic um, form of solutions uh, that are being the cheapest, but in reality, it becomes more and more expensive when we have to think about the whole management through the um, sanitation service chain and how, how to provide these systems, how to, to manage them safely and how to um, how to ensure that they, they perform safely. So yeah, I agree with you, but then that's why it's encouraging to look at options um, maybe because what I was trying to say is that we look um, either on-site sanitation, basic options or unsafe sanitation or sewer. And we've left the, <laughs> what, is, what is in between has been left for a long time without looking for solutions. So maybe maybe it's time to, to try to look for more and more innovations or joint uh, solutions that could be affordable, but at the same time safe and prevent from contamination of the water resources. Yes, thank you very much, Constantina. Um, I don't know if Jan Willem would like to comment on this or uh, we can move. Um, I, I, I have actually a question when I see the, uh, uh, the, the challenge of affordability. Uh, then, then the question to Wambui is, as, as far as I'm concerned, what, what, uh, what is then the uh, alternative that, that, that you have? Is that uh, uh, open defecation? Is that the alternative? Yeah, I, I think uh, this question is uh, to be with Wambui and maybe we will hear further comments on the chat box. Yeah, let us then in the meantime, move on from a question uh, for a question with Mohamed Yassir. He says, groundwater levels are declining worldwide and are there implications for wash and sanitation services that we need to prepare for? Um, Would okay, you like to I reply can, to yeah. that, Constantina? <laughs> yes, yes, I can go for it. Um, Yes, um, we need to we need to look at options to prepare for, and that's why I was saying that uh, we have been looking at the sewer sanitation as the cure for our um, waterborne diseases, for safety. Um, but unfortunately, for many water scarce um, areas in the world, this can not work because gradually the water is reducing. Um, so, so obviously this is not going to work and then we need to look at either options that are um, um, reusing water. So if it's a flush based system to reuse the water uh, instead of uh, discharging it or uh, to look at uh, the potential of using dry uh, systems. Um, again, everything needs to be weighted. We, we always have to account for the available resources, um, the investments, but then also we need to be mindful what we can take because some of these um, innovations that uh, I've tried to touch on are looking at resource recovery, for example. So if in this aspect we look at um, at the excreta or what is produced as a, a resource for um, uh, is a valuable resource that we can use for energy or reuse water or nutrients for agriculture, then things may change because we can also incorporate it into business models to, um, to um, recover some of the investments. Yeah, thank you. Would you like to um, 
add anything to that, uh, dear Jan Willem? Uh, yeah, the aspect of groundwater levels that are declining worldwide, uh, I think that is true. Uh, I can just add here, uh, due to over abstraction, there uh, is a lot of uh, groundwater level uh, declining going on worldwide. Not everywhere. It is, of course, confined to areas where uh, groundwater is heavily used. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I think that is, as far as I'm concerned, my response to the aspect of groundwater levels that are declining worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, let us move on to the next question, also from Wambui. Um, it says the boiling water 96%, they are here 25%. I guess it is referring to some of the statistics that uh, Constantina presented. And the question was the link on disease. Yeah, I mean, um, as I mentioned, this was a master's student study, uh, so it has been uh, quite limited because uh, he had a very limited time for his data collection. So obviously the data was based on questionnaires from households, but the, they have been unlimited uh, questionnaires. So um, also often, yeah, um, we need to go back and reanalyze these data, but sometimes there would be, um, maybe the meaning was that they, what, what they used to purify water is um, boiling, uh, but but many in many cases they may not use all the time the boiling maybe at household but if they're on outside somewhere they wouldn't use any form of pretreatment so yeah this is about to look at a, a relationship between the data that has been collected uh, but but the most important is that um, um, a lot of the households reported um, the real diseases, which was also quite, it's usually quite linked with E. coli um, availability, which, which could be yeah, due to um, improper sanitation or having some of, um, some of the excreta reaching somehow to the groundwater facilities. Yes. Um, let us move on in the meantime with another question from uh, Mr. Rainer Velman. Um, he says, has there been consideration for accepting the groundwater as it is, with or without contamination, but to focus on the use of treatment options for the water, especially household water filters? The groundwater quality can be tested, but it will never be feasible to continuously monitor each water source. Secondly, a lot of the options are quite costly. So the question is whether it is feasible to apply on a large scale, especially in lower income rural settings. Do you have thoughts on this? Sh shall I try to respond to some of it? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the term accepting the groundwater as it is, is a very, a very um, difficult. Uh, and also, what is it? It has a, a lot of dimensions. Um, I think when we look at the uh, urban poor, uh, so just focusing on the case that I discussed, uh, they accept groundwater as it is because they have no option. Um, and uh, any treatment that you do will cost them money, which they don't have. That's, that's the problem. There is so little capital in these areas uh, that it is difficult to, uh, yeah, to install or to uh, experiment with any uh, type of treatment. Cooking the water, for instance, is just way too expensive because you have to get, uh, what is it, the, um, uh, the wood. You have to get the wood from somewhere to cook your water. But people don't do that. It's just too expensive. Uh, and then there, is, um, then there are the authorities uh, and in, uh, in Uganda, the authorities, uh, and now we, we are getting into a completely different discussion, the authorities, they want to shut down the springs that the, uh, that the urban poor use, uh, because this is one of the uh, boundary conditions for getting funding from um, institutes like the World Bank. 
because everybody knows that this groundwater is heavily polluted and people are, are drinking this. So uh, Kampala has tried to close down a few of those springs and there was, uh, and there was a rioting because there is no alternative. There's just no alternative. So um, the word accepting is, 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 has a lot of implications and um, it's not that simple. It has many different dimensions. Uh, yes, groundwater quality can be tested and it is never feasible to continuously monitor each water source. That's absolutely true. Uh, yeah, so I mean that that is that is the case. Uh, we know that groundwater is not moving that fast. So um, if you monitor groundwater quality in your monitoring network, then you should have and uh, you do that uh, fairly properly. Then you should have uh, a good idea of what is going on in terms of groundwater quality and also the use for drinking water. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, you, you, actually, uh, Rainier, you just uh, mentioned it yourself. Uh, a lot of options are quite cost. It's, it's the cost. Uh, so we have been, uh, we have been using filters, um, that, uh, 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 you know, that were installed in, um, a metal container and, uh, with PVC in it. And there were a couple of layers of sand and gravel and things like that, and it all worked well. But the 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 local population was more interested in the iron uh, of the filter than anything else. So it's 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 complicated. It's just complicated. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, I mean, there is a reason why this still is a huge problem worldwide. That's my response. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem. Um, let us move to the next question from um, Sakar Mohamed Rafikua Alam. Um, I noticed that we are running a bit out of time, and I ask um, for our speakers to have a bit more extra time for this, that we address um, some of the remaining questions. Is it okay with you, Jan Willem and Constantina? I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, use great. five minutes. Yeah. yeah, let's take another five minutes. Yeah. Um, in Bangladesh, we have had an experience of having sanitary latrines without any type of lining inside a pit in rural areas using cement rings and slabs at subsidized rates uh, by the government. It is popular. Would you please mention the costs and uh, required space for sanitary latrines that you have presented in the first presentation? So I guess this is to Constantina, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm not sure which uh, sanitary latrines, um, I'm not sure if it's the innovations or any other conventional uh, systems, uh, but uh, my take on this is uh, the cost would vary depending on the local conditions and the type of systems that are uh, adopted to the uh, local customs. Um, so in uh, I really can't give a cost of a conventional <laughs> pit latrine. I can say in South Africa, I used to work um, in South Africa for a while. Um, it would be the equivalent, something between $150 um, to $200, the, the full construction. But I guess this really depends on, on, the, on the place. Um, for the innovations, and the ones that I, I have presented was just to trigger, you know, thinking and discussions that we need to look at some alternatives. Uh, but what I presented to you were, were uh, systems that have not been mass produced yet, and it, they have been installed and being tested in different places. But of course, as, as we know, through the different stages of technology development, until we get to a mass production, the costs are really not so great. Um, so yeah, they're quite high because there are sensors. And um, so, so these ones uh, would not be um, that cheap. But the good news is that I think for the next two to three years, some of these innovations are going 
to be available on the market and the hope is that this would bring uh, the prices down. The inspiration behind some of these systems has been that they would be at uh, low cost, low enough to be um, affordable by anyone um, and especially the operation and maintenance costs to be something like 0.05 US dollar per capita per day uh, which is quite low uh, but whether we are getting there yet um, not yet but slowly <laughs> I would say yes thank you very much Constantina um, I have a next question from uh, Mr. Joseph van den uh, van Oudenhoven. Uh, Josef often encountered a situation where requests being made for designs of facilities, citing lack of know-how and money. But often these facilities are already being present in the countries. He thinks that the main reason for slow progress is that the governments and the local authorities are often not suff sufficiently committed. How can we motivate these governments and local authorities uh, to make more progress? Well, the best way to motivate. You can go, you can go. I can add after that. <laughs> I, I think, you know, what, what we saw. So I'm, I'm just referring to my experiences with transition management. Um, and I'm not here to advocate transition management. What, what I'm trying, my, my point is actually if you can mobilize local communities, then uh, in the case of Uganda, then uh, institutes will start to become committed. So if local communities directly start to talk to, uh, let's say, local governments or local authorities, and they have and they, they have um, well argumented discussions together, then these governments they start to become committed. So I think that 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 would be my response. Uh, so uh, not sufficiently committed is absolutely true, but it is um, it is uh, what is it? Um, uh, it depends. So there there is uh, there is a dynamic that you can uh, that you can um, um, induce by giving the local communities. Uh, a voice, and then something really good can 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 come out. I, I'm, we saw that in these communities, whereby there was so much distrust between uh, uh, the communities towards uh, the local uh, authorities. But after some time, we saw that they really uh, started to work hand in hand together, and that that was really. Uh, uh, an absolute, uh, yeah, good part of uh, of of uh, uh, well, of in this case, transition management. But there are many different ways to mobilize communities in a proper way. Yeah, and I oh, I can add here is what is what is the biggest motivation for a government or local authorities? I think. Well, it's it's for many other <laughs> stakeholders, representatives, but it's it's money. So speaking about how much it costs um, having these problems related to improper sanitation, open defecation, not safely managed sanitation related to groundwater uh, management. Um, so this, if, if it's put into numbers, costs a lot of money to local governments. Um, um, and local authorities to deal with um, treating diseases, hospital placements, people missing out of work, etc. So, if it's possible to uh, show this kind of uh, balance and evaluation on what would be the saving in what they in in their investment per year, could be one way. Um, so, um, what I'm trying to say is that it's often how how the information is presented and of course yes there is a need of all the stakeholder engagements we, we need the local communities to be fully engaged we need the private sector we so speaking about looking at options of how can we turn the the wheel and how can we look at 
resource recovery or, or business models, um, some of these, um, prov the provision of these systems could be more simplified, but still safe. So this could be also a business model for selling and installation and, and um, maintaining. So um, yeah, this is my take on this. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem and Constantina, for sharing insight on this question. We have one remark and two questions, and I, for the sake of time, I think um, if I may ask you to keep it brief with the responses, then, uh, then we can close the webinar with on time. So we have a remark from Mr. Ola uh, Dainde Babatunde from Nigeria. He says, Nigeria just launched a center on integrated national environmental health surveillance system through the Federal Ministry of Environment, strictly on water sanitation, on hygiene, waste, and air quality. We would love to partner uh, as regard to technology transfer and capacity development for health workers. So uh, I think this is a very nice remark and very positive development in Nigeria. Please feel free to get in touch with our speakers today yeah, after the event. Us an, send us an email, Ola Dainden. Yeah. 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 And uh, maybe you can provide your email in the chat box. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Then okay. the next question is uh, from uh, Tess Fay. Thank you very much, Dr. Jan. Um, in order to track and trace these pollutants and take some corrective actions, it is possible to make use of time series data regarding water level and water quality in conjunction with numerical modeling in the basin level. It is needed and how to do that. Yeah. Uh, Tess Fay, I think you're absolutely right. Um, so it starts with the monitoring network um, to understand how your groundwater system is responding uh, and also uh, to understand what the groundwater quality and let's say the mass transport in your aquifer system is. And um, if you want to do a numerical check at uh, a basin level of, about your water balance and how groundwater flow patterns have developed. Uh, absolutely uh, super nice, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And so uh, we have a next question, which is the last one before we close the webinar from uh, Kafrian Hassan. And uh, I am a chemical engineer from Iraq. In my country, we do not have any solution of waste to water from homes. Is there any simple solution that we can conduct? Um, I suppose to, um, to, 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 to understand the situation and to see if it's possible to install these, uh, these solutions. Uh, yes. Uh, so what I was going to say is that um, I, I touched on this on the part which is which it concerns on site sanitation. Um, so, of course, there are many countries where a sewage sanitation has been installed and it's widely used. And um, this is something that I didn't include the present in the presentation because of the time and the focus. But we what we follow is the citywide inclusive sanitation approach, meaning that if if there are sewers that have been already installed and this is um, working or operational, um, so then. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to remove now the sewers and install some appropriate solutions. It means that if there is a part of the population that has not been yet uh, covered by any form of safely managed sanitation service, then we have to relook again what is the, the cheapest and the most um, convenient option. So when I say cheapest, um, of course, maybe some pit latrines could be the cheapest option, but with time, they may not be the most convenient option or maybe not the most dignified if it's just simple pits. So we're speaking about improved sanitation systems that could be on site, but they could be um, a lot more um, pleasant to use. So um, so it's about the combination of, um, of all the solutions, but, um, but of course, yes, it is possible to to look at all the options. Um, there are simplified sewers. There, th there are many options if we want to look at. But the main point is to address the 
uh, not safely managed sanitation because this is directly linked to polluting the environment, including the groundwater facilities, which also, as we saw, is related to um, spreading of, of diseases and a lot more uh, serious complications. Thank you very much, Constantina, and um, thank you very much, um, participants, to share the questions. I have a question. Yes, on. Jan Willem, yes. I have seen that in the chat there are a lot of emails uh, going around. Uh, are you harvesting those email addresses? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. I will uh, collect all the, um, yeah, I will mention that also later. I'll collect all the emails and make sure that we have all those emails and uh, the recording will be shared also afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So uh, with this, I would like to thank you very much, Jan Willem and Constantina, for a very informative and inspiring seminar. I'm sure the insight and the experience shared today will be of much interest for many people working on groundwater and sanitation. And I see that there are a lot of e emails and interactions to be picked up. So um, it's great, fantastic to see. We wish you a lot of health and joys in continuing your great works. I would also like to thank our participants very much for your kind attention and interactions. We will keep you posted about the upcoming webinar, podcasts, and blog articles within this initiative between IG Delft and the Water Channel. Um, last but not least, now that 2022 is uh, getting behind us slowly and 2023 is approaching, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Maria Laura Sorrentino, Alumni Relations Advisor from IHG Delft, to give uh, some season greetings and to close our seminar. Please, uh, over to you, Maria Laura. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to all attendees and to our great speakers today for their collaboration. It was a great pleasure for me to organize with the Water Channel all the online seminars this year. And we will hope to continue next year with other topics and interesting uh, lectures. Thank you very much for your attendance and uh, season greetings for all and all the best wishes. My colleagues are coming back. Have a great December and fruitful new year. See you next year. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye, everybody.